As most of you know, the world has taken, the devil has taken the month of June and turned it into a month of pride. I know I could get canceled for saying some of the things that are going to be said here, but this video might not be exactly what you think it is. Yes, what's happening in the world today is destructive. Yes, it is completely godless and it is horrific and it might very well be the end of our civilization. I was listening to a man named Douglas Murray, not a man I would necessarily recommend. He's a, an atheist from what I gather. He calls himself a homosexual. He's an intellectual from England. And he says that Rome, along with several other na nation states of uh, civilizations, that the end of their civilization was an obsession on gender, an obsession on sexual promiscuity and so on and so forth and that he believes this ideology might very well be the end of the West, America, Canada, so on and so forth. So that is the topic of my discussion today. But just to point out a few obvious things, the book of Proverbs says this about pride. The month of June is labeled pride. Pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Pride goes before the fall, haughty spirit, arrogance, saying, I don't care what the rules are. I don't care what the natural created order is. It does not matter to me one lick what God might think. I'm going to do what I feel like doing. That is pride. And that always goes before destruction. In the book of James, chapter 4, verse 6, he, the writer says, But he giveth more grace. God gives more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. And so here's where the, the, tip, the, to, the topic gets a little bit sensitive for us as Christians or for us as religious people in particular. Because we can look at the pride of this month of June and shake our head at it. We can scoff at it. We can talk about the destruction that is coming. And I think it is coming just like it did on Sodom and Gomorrah. God could not find five righteous souls in the city, in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was destroyed with fire and brimstone. And their sins were many. But one of them in particular, I think that was really amplified and, and exaggerated in that city was that the whole city was given over to sexual promiscuity, sodomy, homosexuality, all kinds of other things that were very destructive. And it led to the literal physical destruction by fire of those cities. Now, not all civilizations have been destroyed in the same sense. However, if you look into the history of Pompeii, the city that was destroyed by a volcano, many of the ancient remains have been found there and much of them seem to indicate and prove that that civilization had gone the same route as Sodom and Gomorrah. But here's where it gets sticky, the tricky point for us. We as Christians, we look at that and we can see the obviousness of their error. We can look at their gross sin and say, how in the world could they be that way? And this is where I would like to flip the script on us, on you and on me, and point you to Romans chapter 2. In chapter 1, Paul had built this case where he's building this ever-widening circle that seems to fit every possible sinner into it. There's a list, a long list at the end of chapter 1 of... of um, People that are proud, people that are arrogant, people that abuse themselves with mankind, people that, you know, on and on, murderers and whoremongers and all that stuff. And then in the middle of there, he says, those that are disobedient to their parents. And then at the end, he says, those that take pleasure in those that do such things. So, so, so many of us would look at this widening circle and say, I can see why God would judge them. Look how horrible they are. I can't believe that they're still alive. Why would God allow them to exist? What are we doing here? God is kind of baiting us. He's allowing us, he's reeling us in by allowing us to look at the horrific sin of the world and think, how could they? In the meanwhile, the whole time, building a case against ourselves. And this is where in Romans chapter 2, he says this, Therefore, based on their sin and the fact that you think it's damnable, the based on the fact that you look at it and you agree with God that those people should suffer punishment of one degree or another. You look at that and you agree with God and he says, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. 
for that thou doest the same things. If you and I are brutally honest with ourselves and we allow our thoughts to be transparent before God, and we allow the light to shine into our own hearts, we find that we've been guilty of some of the very same things. Now, you might be able to say, but I've never done that one thing. Yes, but look at that list in Romans chapter 1, and you will find yourself in that list. I guarantee you. And probably in more of them than you allow yourself to admit. In fact, many of us have been caught in pornography. Most of you men have been at one time or another. That includes homosexuality. That includes often pedophilia. That includes some bestiality. And I don't know what you've all looked at, but it gets ugly fast. And so you might say, well, I didn't do it. But you took pleasure in them that did it. You might say, well, I would never murder. And yet you find some kind of weird, twisted pleasure in someone murdering someone else on a screen. How far down this list do you want to go? All of us have been guilty of these same things. And we look at them and say, how could they? How dare they? They ought to be punished. And he says, therefore thou art an excusable old man. You judge them, and yet you're guilty of the same thing. And he says in verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them that commit such things. And, And he says, And thinkest thou this, old man, that judgest them which do such things, and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? You see what Paul's doing here. God is trying to turn the attention of us to awful, wicked, sinful people and to agree with him that those people should be punished. And then he turns the script around and says, you know, you're guilty of the same. Jesus says, if you look upon a woman with lust in your heart, you've committed adultery already in your heart. If you are angry at your brother without a cause and you have rage and and vengeance in your heart, you've already committed murder in your heart. You're just as guilty in God's perspective just because your social limits didn't allow you to do it or because you didn't act out upon the wickedness of your own heart, doesn't make you superior. Is it better for society? Of course it is. Of course it's better to not kill than to just kill in your heart. But God looks at the heart. God sees your innermost thoughts. And Jesus actually says this. Um, He's speaking to the people in Capernaum in his day. And he says, And thou, Capernaum, which which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, and it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be, and listen to this, this is should blow your mind. It shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. So which sin is worse here? Which category do you think God looks the most harshly at? God saw cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, that were so given over to sin that he destroyed them with fire and brimstone. And then Jesus appears on the scene some thousands of years later, and he comes to his own people, and his own received him not, it says in John chapter 1. And he preached to them the gospel. He raised the dead. He made the blind to see. He made the deaf to hear. He did all kinds of wonderful works in the people in Uh, Capernaum said, I don't think we believe in him. The Pharisees of the day said, I think he has an evil spirit. Maybe he's doing these miraculous things by the prince of devils, Beelzebub. Can you imagine? Now, which one does God look at as the worst of sins? Many times you and I will look at religious people, or we ourselves are sometimes very religious, and we think, well, at least I'm not doing those things. You know, God says that if you are a pretender, If you are a hypocrite, you put on your nice white shirt and button it to the top, you put on your long flowing dress and you do all the things externally that make you appear to be godly perhaps, and yet you're caught in these sins and you're judging and condemning and talking about the pride of the world. The Bible says that there is a darker place in hell for Capernaum than there will be for Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't quite understand that. This is God's perspective, not mine. This is not my words. You know, Jesus will say in that day, you did many wonderful works, but I never knew you. You you fed these people, you helped those people. Maybe you did, maybe you performed great miracles in my name or in so-called Christianity's name. And yet you are worse on the day of judgment than Sodom and Gomorrah. There should be a real concern on our part to not be a hypocrite. You cannot get away with it. 
God looks at your sin as worse than the pride of the month of June and all the disgusting things that are happening. Now, I'm not dismissing any of their sin. Jesus says, if you offend one of these little ones, it would be better for you to tie a millstone about your neck and to be cast into the depths of the sea. So I'm not at all excusing what they are doing. The, what the world is doing today in this month of pride, it is clearly, clearly destructive to children. And they are aiming at our children. If your children are in schools, I would get them out. I should have gotten them out a long time ago. It is a very destructive ideology that is coming for our children, no doubt about it. But religious hypocrisy does worse. You know, Jesus says to the, to the Jews in his day, he says, you travel the world to make one proselyte and you turn him into twice the son of hell than you are yourself. Don't deceive yourself in thinking that there's good religious people and then there's the evil sinful people. Both sides, God says, are damnable. There is only one true way and it is the Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one way of humility and it is recognizing that you are guilty of hell. You are guilty of God's judgment and it is only the sacrifice of Christ that can lift you out of that judgment. The wrath of God abides upon you if you do not trust in his son. I don't care if you're as righteous as Nicodemus, you must be born again. There is no excusing your sin by covering it over with good religious external garments. There is only one way to escape the wrath and judgment of God, and it is by accepting what Jesus did on the cross, taking your wrath, your pride, your judgment, your shame, your guilt, and carrying it to the cruel, bloody cross, dying for the sins of the world, being buried in the grave, and being raised again to new life. Now, when you do accept that, you can rejoice. You can celebrate in the greatness of God and who He is and His acceptance of you, not because you've become good, not because you've put on the right clothes and gone to the right services, but because you've been crucified. You've been buried. You've been raised again with the Lord Jesus. He took your sins, He nailed them to the cross, and it's all been taken out of the way, and you now can rejoice in the fact that even though you had pride, even though you had hypocrisy, even though you took part in the, the pride of our day and age, you can be completely forgiven, washed clean because of what God has done. So this month of pride and the pride of hypocrisy, the pride of religiosity, should remind us of the goodness and holiness and righteousness of God. And it should humble us to the, to the dirt to the dirt and then exalt us in rejoicing in the goodness of God. The only kind of pride we should be having is pride in the fact that God has done a work. We're proud of God. We're proud of His accomplishment on our behalf.